<laughs> Hello and welcome to episode 144 of How to Survive. My name's Chris, and joining me, as ever, 100,000 sperm, and he was the fastest, Joe Sherville. Yep, well that's quite an accolade. Yeah, yeah, and it's also a quote from this week's film, from the year 2000, it's Martin Campbell's Vertical Limit. Yeah, Martin Campbell, who went on to do... Direct what? Casino Royale. Yes. And had already directed uh, GoldenEye. Yes. And also directed the recent Jackie Chan, Pierce Brosnan doubleheader, The Foreigner. Is that good? No. (laughs) This week's film was recommended by Wendy Preston, uh, who asked... um, I was wondering if you'd do the great film Vertical Limit with the late, great... Game over man himself, Bill Paxton. It's my 40th birthday in May, and this would be a great present. Well, happy birthday, Wendy. Yes. Because that's the film we're talking about this week. If you haven't heard the How to Survive podcast before, Mm -hmm. then uh, strap yourselves in. Yeah. uh, Because we're going to be climbing to the top. (laughs) Yeah. (laughs) Summiting. I mean, you've had 18 years this year. Yeah. Wendy Uh, was 22 when this came out. Yeah. Yeah. I'm sure she'll be... Delighted <laughs> that you've reminded her of that. Uh, but if you haven't seen Vertical Limit, as part of the How to Survive podcast, in order to know how best to survive the film, we first need to recap everything that happens in it. Uh, and of course, that means spoilers all the way through. And then we'll talk about whether or not we like the film. And then on to the famous, the infamous How to Survive chat. Yes. Joe, are you ready? Yeah, I think so. I've got my nitrous packed in my backpack. Yeah, you've strapped on your crampons. Yep. And uh, we've got uh, carabiners at the ready yes. as we prepare to go to the vertical limit. Stomach team, this is Base Camp. Weather tracking shows storm building at 26,000 feet. Advise return. I repeat, advise return. Pump on the plate. I thought I was paying you to get me to the top. Oh, I think we should keep going. Climbing in pairs. They think it's suicide. I'll write a check to whoever goes. Half a million dollars. Now, the lives of three. My brother's got explosives. Says they're gonna blast their way down. Strap on the nitro. Will depend on the courage of six. On a rescue mission, we don't vote, we don't question, we don't argue. You listen and do exactly as I say. What is the vertical limit? Um, I guess it's like when you get into the death zone. That is the the vertical limit of human life. <laughs> like, but that's like a height limit, isn't it? Yeah. Altitude limit. Well, where, the film where, should where, be called Altitude Limit. But it, that's vertical. If it was horizontal limit, yeah, there, vertical, is, there isn't a horizontal Vertical is more limit. of a like angle descriptor, isn't it? Yeah. But where, where do you think they've gone? Yeah, but it's like... They're not... This, they've, yeah, but it's, it's like... That's like saying, oh, he's reached the vertical limit, as though if a human stands vertically... That's like the limit of them. Do you know what I mean? Well, so if, it if, should if, be if someone was limit. if someone was like twenty thousand feet tall, that would be a problem. <laughs> it would be. <laughs> You're right. Vertical limit. While climbing in Monument Valley, Peter and Annie Garrett are left hanging by a rope along with their father Royce. At Royce's insistence, and despite Annie's pleas, Peter cuts his father free sending him to his death to ensure he and his sister survive. Yeah, it's a very tense scene, which is punctuated by a really inappropriate, like, sandbag drop of the body at the end. Yeah. Do you think that was inappropriate? I thought it, it was, was a, uh, is setting its stall out early. No, it was weird, because it was like, it was like, oh, it's all tense. And then it's just like this, and you're like, yeah. oh, God. A, w- a wet thud. Yeah. Yeesh. Three years later, Peter works as a photographer and is at the K2 Mountain Base Camp when his sister, with whom he is now estranged, arrives to attempt a summit attempt with the funding of billionaire Elliot Vaughan as a marketing ploy for his new airline. A previous summit attempt ended with Vaughan as the sole survivor of the expedition. 
At a gala to celebrate the summit attempt, Vaughan's speech is interrupted by Montgomery Wick, a veteran climber and K2 expert. It is revealed that Wick's wife died from pulmonary edema on Vaughan's previous expedition as they were stuck in a storm and she had lost her dexamethasone, a medicine to prevent edema. Wick now searches fruitlessly for his wife's body on the mountainside. Basically lives on the mountain and just travels around looking in caves. And Trying to find his wife's body. Yeah. The expedition soon becomes a disaster to disaster due to Vaughan's refusal to turn back in the face of severe weather warnings. Strong winds soon cause an avalanche and trap Vaughan, Annie, and the expedition's guide, Tom McLaren, in a crevasse. Annie uses static to send a Morse code signal to base camp that they are still alive and Peter assembles a rescue team with the help of brothers Cyril and Malcolm, Medic Monique, Climber Kareem and Montgomery Wick. The group plan to use canisters of volatile nitroglycerin donated by the Pakistani army to blow their way into the crevasse and rescue the survivors. That is probably the best line (laughs) <laughs> from any plot ever. <laughs> the group plan to use canisters of volatile nitroglycerin donated by the Pakistani army to blow their way into the crevasse and rescue the survivors. Yeah. When you, when you hear that line, you know you're in for a treat for the rest of the film. The group splits into pairs with one canister of explosives each and sets off. Cyril and Monique encounter trouble when Cyril loses his balance and ends up clinging to the edge of a cliff. During Monique's attempt to rescue him, he drops his canister from the cliff, causing an explosion which creates another avalanche. Though Monique manages to hang onto the cliff, Cyril is swept over and killed. Back at base camp, the army discover that the nitroglycerin canisters explode when exposed to direct sunlight. Peter, Wick and Monique, who is now rejoined with the other two, manage to cool theirs in the shade and radio Kareem and Malcolm who do the same, though they are unaware that their canister is leaking nitroglycerin fluid. Sunlight hits the explosive fluid and Malcolm and Kareem are killed. In the ensuing, there's a nice little touch in that scene as well where mm. they, uh, they're about to share some water yeah. in like relief and then fumble it between <laughs> themselves and drop it, which yes. is really like, and then like laugh about it. And, and as then, they're laughing, yeah. they get vaporized. It's, it's an amazing like, Tension, break tension, build tension. It's great. Yeah. In the ensuing blast, some ice is shaken from the glacier and Wick discovers the body of his wife next to an empty box of decks, implying that Vaughan stole her supply to save himself and left her to die. Realising Wick's designs for... Wick's designs for revenge on Vaughan, Peter and Monique continue on without him. In the crevasse, McLaren is gravely ill, so Vaughan murders him with a syringe full of air to save the remaining decks for himself. Mm. Annie is too weak to confront Vaughan and helps him mark their position with a flare using McLaren's blood to paint an X on their location. Pretty Pe- brutal, isn't it? It's like yeah, grisly. It yeah, it is. Uh, Peter and Monique blast their way in and are joined by Wick, who promises Peter he will save Annie. Climbing into the crevasse, Wick attaches harnesses to both Annie and Vaughan, with whom he has a sort of brief scuffle, Yeah, because uh, Vaughan thinks he's there to kill him. But as they are being hoisted up, an ice boulder falls, knocking Wick and Vaughan into the crevasse and pulling Peter and Annie down. With no other option, Wick cuts his rope, saving Peter and Annie and fulfilling his revenge on Vaughan, who is hanging beneath him. What are the odds? What are the odds of that exact situation happening twice? Yeah. Once every three years, like clockwork. (laughs) Back at the K2 base camp, Annie reconciles with Peter, who pays his respects to the dead at a memorial. And that, Joe, was vertical limit. Yes, it was. It was the limit of all vertices. Yeah. It was great. Yeah. Uh, Yeah, it was really a a fun film. Yeah, a little bit of cultural context for you. Go on. Sometimes I like to do that. Martin Campbell, as you mentioned, also directed Goldeneye, Casino Royale, and The Mask of Zorro. Yeah, right. Which also starred um, Monique, right? Uh, Possibly. Well, she was in Goldeneye. Yeah. Who was she in Goldeneye? uh, She was Natalia. Oh, right, yeah. Um, It's... uh, 
It basically stars every 90s star that didn't end up becoming a big deal. Right. Do you know what I mean? Yeah. Like Isabella Sco- S- Skorupko. Yes. Isabella Skorupko, who's okay. in Goldeneye. Uh, Chris O'Donnell, obviously from Batman yeah. and Robin. Robin. Robin himself. Uh, yeah. Robin's Honey from yeah. The Craft, later seen in uh, Prison Break. Yeah. Was she Sarah at Prison Break? Uh, no, she was um, the Veronica. Veronica okay. Court. No. What's her name? Veronica, somebody, in the first season. She's like a journalist. Right. Who's trying to help Lincoln. Oh, God. Uh, <laughs> and there's decent turns from uh, Bill Paxton. May you rest in peace. Yeah. Scott Glenn. And he's an, great. He's, yeah. yeah he's, he's, he's basically, really. with, I mean, next week we're doing Point Break. Yeah. He's basically Gary Boosie's energy, hasn't he? Just yeah. a maniac on a mountain. Yeah. yeah. He's great. He's... He knows exactly what film he's in yeah. and he's hitting it perfectly. And then, of course, Ben Mendelsohn, mm. who sort of did this, seemingly, disappeared for 10 years and then now is in, you know, most mainstream blockbusters. Most of them. Yeah, well, Re- Ready Player One. Yeah. Rogue One. Yes. Any film with one in the title, Ben Mendelsohn's there. Yeah. Um, I watched this film, I think, around the time it came out. Yeah, I think, um, I think possibly the same. I remember yeah. talking about it, at least, at the time. Yeah, I think it was that. rented uh, mm. from a, a local video store. Video Solent. Yeah. Yeah. Po- yeah. yeah. And, um, and I remember watching it and enjoying it. Uh, I was probably... It, it felt quite adult yeah. at the time. And I wonder if that's because within the first 10 minutes you have a man falling to his death yeah. and then a sort of like half graphic uh, leg what, break. What is that about? It's like, <laughs> I always want to so, mention that. Like, so it's the fucking ph- crazy. The photographer, uh, when, when um, Peter is a photographer, yeah. he has an assistant. Like a show. And they're like walking yeah. down a hill and the Sherpa gets distracted and like falls. And then as he's tumbling down the hill, his leg gets caught between two rocks. <laughs> yeah. And he like, Basically snaps his leg off. It's like it's he. There's no reason for him to fall in the first place. He just like fumbles. It's yeah, just, and then then breaks his leg. It's really strange. Yeah, and then like the scene's over Maybe. with just him being loaded in a helicopter. <laughs> but it's that is um, that's mad. Yeah, yeah. and then uh, I think I didn't see the film for about 15 years, mm. and then watched it a few years ago, thinking like, oh yeah, good, like vertical limit. That's that'd be like a stupid guilty pleasure type thing. But it's actually good. Yeah. <laughs> it is. A, it is actually yeah, good. Yeah. And I think I said to you that when I was watching it um, this time around, I was like, I was waiting for the bit where it becomes shit. Yeah. But it never does. There are there are moments of being like, um, where maybe like some plot contrivances. Which, oh, absolutely. Yeah. Like the I think the biggest one. I mean, they're all, they're all fairly forgivable because they're pretty well executed. Yeah. Right. Uh, but the one that really sticks in my craw is when it just from nowhere just does like a pan across a room yeah. and you realise that it's in the nitroglycerin containment room right and this the reveal that sunlight makes the nitroglycerin explode mm-hmm. but it's like all of the canisters that we saw in the film are leaking mm-hmm. it's like well all of one yeah. I'd understand yeah all of them is that's really bad design it's very bad yeah Poor, poorly thought out I, re- I read the um I could, I could forgive it because in my head this week I've got a thing I read about Pixar's writing thing, like style. And one of the rules they have is that uh, coincidences and contrivances are okay to put a character in danger, mm-hmm. but they're not okay to get them out of danger. I see, right. Okay. So it's, it's perfectly acceptable yeah. that this would People happen. are more willing to believe bad luck than good luck, maybe. Yeah, yeah basically. Um, yeah. I, th- I genuinely... I think this is a great film. Yeah. And I think it's a really underappreciated, like, noughties gem. Yeah. Although it feels a lot like a it's, 90s yeah, film. It's, it's because 90s, yeah. everyone in it, as we said, is from the 90s. Uh, yeah. I like, it's almost like there's some sort of career curse around Vertical Limit. Like, everyone in it went on to do Nothing. not much. Yeah. Apart from Ben Mendelsohn, and he took a decade to recover <laughs> from it. It's, I mean, what I like about it is the stakes all feel very real. Yeah. I mean, we watched Everest, I'm talking two years ago now, mm-hmm. when we first started this podcast. Uh, that felt real because it was, but it was a real story. But it felt real because there was no patronising like, explanations of what's going on. Mm-hmm. I mean, it's, it's an obvious comparison because they're up K2. Yeah. You know, but it's a similar thing. And as much as people up a mountain, it's dangerous, they're going to die. You, don't, mm. you mean they're up K2 in this film? Yes. 
not in the other film. No. Which is called Quite Everest. Everest. No. <laughs> Quite right. I mean, the, the motivations are all believable. Yeah. That people want to save each other mm -hmm. uh, or get money in some cases. Even the villain was sometimes sympathetic. Yeah. It, it, when he starts out with, like, oh, no, we're saving the, saving the medicine for rationing. We don't yeah. use it all up at once. And you're like, no, he's got a, he's got a fair point. And then mm -hmm. you go, oh, no, wait, he is actually a moustache twirling villain. Yeah, uh, yeah. And that, um, it's all, like, nicely uh, seeded, all yeah. that stuff, I think. Um, is you know, like it feels organic the way that all develops. Yeah, exactly. The, the storytelling. Of it. Mm. Uh, I had my hand over my mouth, riveted, I'd say, for a lot of the more physical action. Mm -hmm. uh, and by that, I mean the climbing, jumping, running, just anything that involves physicality. Yeah. Uh, and it was genuinely terrifying because yeah. like, hanging over the edge, it looked real. It looked yeah. like there were people hanging over the edge. Well, I, I think this is made maybe just before the sort of CGI boom yeah. of the early noughties. Um, you know, it's a year after Phantom Menace, a year after The Matrix. Yeah. So it was probably in production at a similar time. And I think one thing that stands out now is that uh, is the special effects because it seems like there's an effort made to avoid having CGI. Yeah. And there's a lot of practical effects, a lot of matte paintings, I noticed, yeah, yeah, yeah. which look really good still. Uh, the stunts are really good, as you said. Um, everything has weight, which, like, if you compare it to action films from the, the mid-noughties, yeah. certainly isn't the case. Right, take something like Equilibrium, Resident Evil. Yeah, uh, Hancock, yeah. or, you know... Matrix Reloaded. Yeah. Like... All those sorts of films, the CGI rubber man is in full effect, basically. Yeah. Whereas in this, it feels like all the actors are really in danger, uh, even though, you know, they're probably on a set or yeah. on the side of a mountain. Um, and yeah, I think, it's, I, I think it's the kind of sort of, not triple A blockbuster, but like a double A blockbuster yeah, yeah. that you just don't get nowadays. You know, you only get the, you know, 300 million Avengers films and the sort of low budget indie films yeah. because this this mid tier blockbuster just doesn't make money anymore. No, and it would be it would probably be too expensive to build a set which looks like a mountainside when you can do it on a CGI. Yeah, uh, and it's yeah. I mean, if you pitch this idea, you probably wouldn't get it through now. I don't yeah, know. Yeah, maybe not. It's pretty. Weird. What it reminded me of though mm -hmm. is classic disaster movies right okay i thought it had more in common with something like towering inferno or poseidon adventure than it did with say triple x mm -hmm. or point break next week's movie yeah um which i mean on on face value you could say this is an extreme sports survival movie yeah which in a way it is mm -hmm. but actually i think it's more like uh the the extreme sports angle is almost incidental it's more of a rescue and recovery in a disaster zone and the best people for the job just happen to be extreme sports enthusiasts. Yeah, yeah. And it's like they would... It feels natural because they are the only people who... Exactly, yeah. Th it. There's no, like, yeah. people who would go up there anyway. Yeah, and, it's, and also it's a sort of, I suppose, style of extreme sport um, which the people don't look good doing it. No. Do you know what I mean? It's not like Triple X where, you know, he is saving hostages on a skateboard or right exactly. <laughs> like, yeah, yeah, yeah. and doing kickflips yeah it's, like, it's 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 like that that's unnecessary yeah. you don't need to be on the skateboard but yeah. in in this you do have to literally jump across a canyon because time's against you yeah it's like yeah. there's a difference between um it's like the difference between x games and you will die if you mess it up <laughs> yeah. <laughs> like, yeah. Yeah, I mean? yeah 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 i think some of like i said before like it reminds me of a disaster movie because of the weird things that crop up. Like there's a scene where they're jumping off a helicopter mm. and the blades of the helicopter are like edging towards Monique yeah. as she's trying to like slide away. And it's like... It's horrible. It's horrible, yeah. yeah. But it's like, this is what would happen in, in Towering Inferno. Yeah. Like you just get someone trapped in a room with a like a, a spinning electricity cable. Yeah, yeah. Or, you know, you get a cutaway to the, the, the room where... It's, it's, I'm thinking of Towering Inferno, mm -hmm. the room where the fire starts. And it, it, that's very contrived because it's like a barrel of oil with yeah, a, yeah. a spark and a fuse, fuse box. Yeah, yeah. yeah, right? And that's very similar to the reveal of the nitroglycerin. It's just, yeah. it, it just pans away and you go like, yeah. it just plants a nice seed which helps the plot mm. and ramps up the tension in a really nice way. Yeah, and I think those sorts of contrivances work when you're invested in the film. Yeah. And a big part of that is 
um although there's sort of a lot of broad it's a broad film like there's broad characterization yeah. of all the rescue team like they're all likable though yeah. even though they've got their foibles and there's one who's a bit of a sex pest yes like it's but oh, I, okay I was thinking about this he is a sex pest but it seems to go down okay with everyone involved yeah. it's almost like he's like judged the situation made a joke which is what we think is off colour yeah they're all loving it it's a, it's a few dodgy lines like yeah. the one that made me roll my eyes uh was Malcolm in the helicopter mm. when he says, uh, you see him like stretching his leg mm. and his brother says, what are you trying to do? He's like, I'm trying to kiss my ass goodbye. Yeah. And you're like, mm, that's, come yeah. On. yeah. <laughs> come on now. It wasn't even like, delivered well. It's, no, yeah. exactly. And, I'm uh, trying to kiss goodbye to my ass. <laughs> <laughs> but I think the spirit of the film comes through and that's one of sort of teamwork and... You know, like like the classic disaster movies, it's the the group of uh, like um, not oddballs, but you know, people who aren't necessarily friends, forced yeah. to work together as a team yeah. to to save some people, and that that is an engaging format for a film. Yes, exactly. And it was in the seventies, and it is in the noughties as well. Yeah, this film's a lot like um, a film that you and I have watched recently. Yes. Which is called Sorcerer. Yeah. Which is the film William Friedkin made after The Exorcist. Yes. And if you're thinking, oh, Sorcerer, I wonder, wonder what that's what, called. What's, what are sort of supernatural yeah. horrors involved yeah. in that? What it should be called is uh, Explosive Truck Film. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> because, I mean, it's it's ba- that itself is basically a remake of a film called Wages of Fear. Yes. And which is a better name for the film. Yeah. And... The, the plot of all these three films is essentially the same in that uh, a group of people have to transport volatile explosives mm. from point A to point B for a reason. Yeah. And, uh, I mean, so- I haven't seen Wages of Fear, but Sorcerer has mm. one of the most intense um, yeah. it- sequences I've ever seen in a film. No, right, yeah. Which yeah. involves a truck trying to cross a bridge. And if you haven't seen Sorcerer, then I'd really recommend not only watching it, but stick with it when you start yeah. to watch it because it's, it's, it's got a, a difficult burner. 40 minutes to to begin with. Yeah. But it really rewards My, my understanding is it's almost a direct remake of Rages of Fear. Yeah. To, down to like the characters and things like that. Yeah. So I think... And is Wages of Fear a novel, I think, uh, as well? Possibly, yeah. It's a, it's a well-told story. My, yeah. my worry... My worry is that Vertical Limit being a remake of it is probably a bit... Of a stretch, I I read I read the same IMDb trivia as you. Well, it's it's a um, it's not a strict remake by any means, obviously, but it's like a reframing of that. They took a device from it, yeah. And the there's something about that device which is to say films that have sensitive explosives in, yeah, right, which is so compelling, (laughs) (laughs) and, and it always is like sensitive explosives and jeopardy. And and it just makes you think. It, it, um, yeah, it, it brings stakes into it. Yeah, it? in yeah. the same way that a quiet place maybe has you, uh, you know, becoming suddenly really conscious of all the noise that you're making. Yeah, uh, I feel like these films, like you, you think how steady could I hold something? Yeah, like I'd say this is a bit different in this. I mean, Sorcerer. It feels like every single movement in the whole film is like, oh, God. Yeah. But They're going over like potholes yeah. and you're like, oh, my God. Yeah. You're like, you were, I had to have a bath after this because I sweated so much. <laughs> but the, yeah. I think in Vertical Limit, it seems a bit less clear how, how violent you can be with the thing. That is basically as violent as the story needs you to be. <laughs> right. Yeah. Um, but, I mean, it, it reminded me of, do you remember the... Leslie asked in in Lost. He was like the high school professor. Ah, uh, yeah, and asked, he's like he's yeah. an expert in explosives somehow because he's like a, right. a, a um, Walter White sort of figure, hmm. uh, like a master of chemistry. And he picks up this TNT and it just blows up. He said he's 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 illustrating how volatile it can be. Yeah, and picks a stick up and it explodes. Yeah, and blows into pieces yeah but that then from then on every time they like even have tnt in the frame you're like yeah oh my god yeah um 
yeah. The, the, the one moment in particular that made me think of it was um, when they're opening the canister mm. at the end and he's doing it with like his gloves on. Yeah. And if you've ever tried to do anything with ski gloves on, it's, it's borderline impossible because <laughs> you have no dexterity at all. Yeah. And his hands would have been numb. Yeah. Like imagine opening a volatile canister of explosives with like, imagine sitting on your hands for half an hour and then trying to do it. Yeah. It's, uh, it's terrifying. Yeah, <laughs> yeah, it is. It's ridiculous. It's like bright green nitro glycerin. Yeah, yeah, S- like a s- gently smoking yeah. whenever it's on screen. So, uh, Joe, this film features mountain climbing. Oh boy! And extreme sports. No quiz this week, I'm afraid. Oh no. Um, but how do you feel about? Because uh, this ties into next week's film, as you I think mentioned, Point Break. Um, another extreme sports film. What, what are your thoughts on sort of extreme sports, self endangerment uh, in the pursuit of a rush? I'm I'm a fan of it. I, I've booked the skydive for this year. Really? Yeah. Okay. I'm um, doing that in August. I'm thinking some great video content for how to survive. Yeah. Right. Absolutely. Um, I I enjoy things that put me at risk to a managed extent. Yeah. Um, managed risk. Yeah. Yeah. I I signed in the past. I signed up for a six month mixed martial arts cage fighting course. Mm-hmm. Uh, it didn't didn't come off. Yeah, not my Medi- own. medical issues, wasn't it? No, <laughs> no, it was um, your uh, shin splints. <laughs> no, they, just, they just didn't. They, they didn't come. Like the the course didn't start. For sure, reason. yeah, yeah. But I I remember when I was preparing for that, um, I read a lot of books about fighting. Yeah, and one quote that, which stuck with me and is one that like it explains I think the mindset behind any of these extreme sports mm. is this. And apparently this was what um, JFK mm-hmm. carried in his wallet. He carried this quote and read it you know, every day. It, it's probably apocryphal. But it says, The bullfight critics, ranked in rows, fill the enormous plaza full, but only one is there who knows, and he's the one who fights the bull. What do you think about that? Um... I mean, I understand it. Yes. Uh, I think a lot of people who uh, don't like bullfighting probably don't go to watch it. But yeah, but... I, think I get that it's an yeah. allegory. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, yeah. Um, yeah, uh, I, I, yeah, I can understand any sort of achievement, whether it's running a marathon or climbing mm. a mountain or, you know... Yeah. Whatever. There's a certain, uh, I guess, psychological advantage to knowing that, you know, what that you're doing something people haven't done or you, mm. people can't do. Yeah. It's and it's it's quite a macho thing as well. Isn't or like it, you know, it? sort of yeah. um, that sort of aggression towards achievement. Yes. And I say macho. I, I don't mean that in a sort of gendered way. I just mean a sort of, um, you know, in a stereotypical sense. Yes. Yeah, right. You know. Because, uh, yeah, I think I think aggression towards achievement is probably more the case. It's like being so totally focused on something and putting your life on the line mm. to say, like... I mean, a, f- it, a fight is different to, a, a s- like, skiing, for example. Yeah. But there, there's still stakes. Yeah, I think, I think this film's different from Point Break because the endeavour that the main group of protagonists are going through is... Rescue. Is rescue, yeah. Uh, not just which is obviously it. extremely honourable and stuff. I I have less time for, you know, the idea of uh, Lone Star State billionaires paying to be dragged up a mountain because it will make them feel important. Legit, like mm. and and that sort of brand of. Uh, I think I think when people do things to show off, it's it's anathema to me. You know what I mean? Like yeah. So a lot of those. You know, Red Bull videos of people uh, mountain biking along the, a, a ridge on yeah. a mountain, and you know those sorts of things. I I get them, but they just don't have any really? appeal for me. I yeah. I'd love to do stuff like that. No, I, I, d- I just uh, holds, holds no interest for me. Really? Yeah. I want to do like a, a crane climbing. Do you know what I mean? What free? Yeah, uh, free climbing. I'm, I I I won't do it because I don't have any strength in me to do that yeah. sort of thing yeah, yeah. and I would die hmm. but if I was a climber maybe yeah it's 
I th- uh, it's dangerous. It's a dangerous way to think. It is dangerous. If you're at home, or if indeed you are climbing a crane right now, then uh, maybe... Turn back. Yeah, have a, have a think about your values <laughs> in life. Do you, would you climb a crane in, no. under any circumstances? No, absolutely. A million not. pounds? Um, what? W- with no safety? Yeah. No. Not worth it? I don't think so. Would never go? What? Like... Climb the ladder interior in the interior. I think generally, I've watched a lot of these videos because yeah. I'm a bit like obsessed. Yeah, I am. I think generally you climb the ladder to a certain height, and mm. then the ladder is, doesn't exist anymore, and mm-hmm. you have to climb the actual rig. Yeah. Then it becomes a bit more insane. Yeah, yeah. It's properly insane. Yeah. That's why we're, I, I no. Mm. I I, I've always thought right skydiving is interesting to me because it's like a bit more <laughs> how interesting. <laughs> It's like controlled and you know, yeah. you've got a shoot and a backup shoot. Base jumping's always been like, what the fuck is this about? Because hmm. you've, you've got like, what, two seconds to get it right? Yeah. There's a video. Or wing suiting. Wing suiting is crazy. That is genuinely crazy. Have you seen the videos of that? Yeah. They're yeah, going like yeah. 100 miles an hour, like straight down at times. Hmm. It's fucking crazy. Honestly. Oh, I love that shit. Yeah. But the. There's a video I've seen of some guy who bought... <laughs> he was in Brazil. He bought um, a parachute off Craigslist. <laughs> or whatever, like, Gumtree equivalent they've got there. Yeah. And he's just on top of his, like, block of flats. And his whole family are watching. And his wife's like, no, don't do it, don't do it. And he's like, no, I have to do it. And he's like, why do you don't have to do this? <laughs> he does it. And it works. He lands safely. Right. And his kids are like, oh, my, my dad's the best. Yeah. But... Genuinely, what the fuck? Yeah, he bought <laughs> second hand. Imagine buying a parachute on your yeah. I think that's the scariest video I've ever seen. Yeah, uh, it's those um, like Russian swing videos. Do you yeah, know what I mean? Yeah, Where yeah. it's off the side of like uh, um, apartment buildings, mm. and they're they're on like one hundred foot ropes. like bungee ropes. Yeah. That's just insanity. I've done a few things like that. Not like, I haven't rigged it up myself or anything. I yeah, think. I think that's the insane part. Yeah. <laughs> that's like buying a <laughs> parachute off Craigslist. Yeah, yeah. Yeah. Well, don't do that if you'd like to survive uh, your future skydive, Joe. Mm. I would make sure that you go with a uh, fully approved one. Yes. But what other how to survive tips have you got for the characters of a vertical limit? First of all, um, it may seem fairly straightforward to a modern audience. And I, I thought maybe in 2000, this, they'd have similar values. Mm-hmm. Put your cigarettes out, guys. Yeah. Number of reasons. First of all, it give you cancer, uh, which is proven. World Health Organization have said that for a long time. Yeah. Since the 70s. So this shouldn't be news to you. Mm-hmm. Uh, secondly, lung capacity will be inhibited. Okay. And what yeah. you need when you're in the ozone is lung capacity. Yeah. Because otherwise you'll die from edema. Yeah. Uh, thirdly, a demon? <laughs> <laughs> thirdly, uh, you are carrying the world's most volatile explosive yeah. on your back. Mm-hmm. I would say all those things combined mean that, that the worst thing you could possibly do is carry a source of ignition yeah. in your Do mouth. they smoke during the rescue attempt? It doesn't matter. They 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 smoke right. Close don't enough don't to smoke it. if you've got an interest in mountain climbing. Yeah. basically. Yeah, or if you're during a mountain climb. Yeah, uh, they, she smokes in the helicopter with the, the glycerin. Yeah, that proof. is uh, that That's is crazy. called out. Yeah, on, she's called out on that. End. Yeah, but it's it's not like oh, I'll put that cigarette out. But I want like a Gordon Ramsay like. What are you doing? Storms over and yeah. What is smoking next to nitroglycerin? Are you crazy? Yeah. What the fuck is wrong with you? Yeah. That's what I want. That's right. what I was thinking. Yeah. Yeah, it's a fair thought to have. I think. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Uh, yeah, I can't argue that. There's, I like that. There's multiple uh, contexts with which it's good advice in this film. Yeah. Don't smoke near explosives and don't smoke if you need to climb mountains. Yeah. It's uh, it's good advice. Um, smoke dope as well. They're all smoking weed. Yeah, they, they, it's not like said, but there's a guy smoking whilst wearing an, a mad bandana with a cannabis leaf. On. Yeah, so you're like, wow, yeah. good. Is that when he's sitting naked on a deck uh, chair? Yeah, one of them. Yeah, yeah. Well, um, good advice there, I would say, Joe. My uh, my first um, bit of advice is uh, 
sort of questioning the questioning the nature of um, rescue attempts in general. <laughs> okay, right. Uh, I mean, looking at net survival I mean, in this uh, film, yeah. it's a poor showing. It, it really is. Right. 80% of the original expedition <laughs> die. So four out of five people. And then 60% of the rescue team die uh, in order to save uh, one of the original, original team. It, it is, it reminds me of the sort of thing where my dad often says it like, you know, if Prince Charles got a cold, he'd be in hospital, private hospital, like sort it out. He wouldn't. He wouldn't have yeah. to worry if he would go ill. Um, it's just. It, I mean, imagine if Prince Charles got stuck up a mountain. Many people would have to risk their lives to save him. Yeah. And it's like, what do these two, this brother and sister, have on everyone? Yeah. That means that they are such VIPs. I think. I think there's a. It's one of those cultural things where you know mountain climbers. It's like no man left behind type situation, but. The but, mountain's full of people who've been left behind. Yeah, after a certain point, you're throwing throwing good money after bad. You're right, yeah. Um, and so I would like to suggest that um, just leave them up there to die because two-thirds of them die anyway. Yeah. You're only going to get Annie back, which admittedly is um, is Peter's main concern. Yeah. Uh, but everyone there should say, look, there's very little we can do. Yeah. And you must understand that as yeah. a climber. Yeah. Um, yeah, so a death count of eight people. Uh, when how many went in? Eleven, uh, uh, fifth, five, ele- five people. Eleven total. Yeah, and eight die. Yeah, it's terrible. Peter, Annie, and uh, Monique survive, don't they? Right, that's it. That's f- it's crazy. It's absolutely insane. Yeah, that's like you, it's, 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 oh, it's really. insanity. Yeah, yeah, yeah. You wouldn't. You would not. Like NASA wouldn't launch on those odds. No, would no. they? And. And they don't in the Martian. Yeah, you recall they um, basically. It's like I guess at a certain point you're you, you should hope that um, let's say let's say X number of people are in danger, right? Mm. You should hope that more people are saved, like more people are alive at the end of the rescue yeah. attempt than are at dead. the beginning, right? <laughs> or you, like. Yeah, I know. If, if they don't go up there, yeah. five people die in yeah. total. Right. If having gone up there, eight people die. If there was a fire in this building now, we're in the top floor of this building, mm-hmm. for argument's sake. And the, they were like people downstairs. They say, say, there's two of us. They'd have to be what, four or five of them. Mm-hmm. One of us would die, and all of them except one would die. Yeah, saving us. Yeah, you'd think they'd go. But there's, there's no. Yeah, yeah, it's logical. And then that would be. I mean, the real tragedy would be the loss of the How to Survive podcast. Of course, it would be. Yeah. yeah. Um, but yeah, that was my sort of uh, totting up of, yeah. <laughs> of the people who die in this film. Fair enough. I no, I can't. I can't disagree with that. Mm. Net survival logic. Don't go. Yeah. Right. Have you got any uh, any ideas? Yeah, ones. Um, I don't know if you noticed. This film is quite um, quite bad at orientalizing. Yeah. Okay. It's. Um, the uh, the Buddhist prayer stuff. That's one thing. You've got the like the Pakistani army mm-hmm. generally seem a bit weird. They're like obsessed with tea. Um, maybe that's the truth. I don't think so. You've, you, generally, it's just like everyone's a bit odd. Like they're what you described it as broad strokes earlier. Right? Yeah, they're very broad stroke Asian people. Yeah, uh, would you agree? Uh, yeah, they caricatures is the word that you're looking for. Yes, quite right. Um, one of the people who goes up the mountain, remember his name? Uh, In the rescue team? Kareem. Kareem, right? He stands up and says, uh, my cousin's up there, it's my duty to Mm -hmm. go. Now, I don't think it is your duty for any reason other than the film was written by orientalizing racists. Right, you're basically saying that um, the filmmakers believe that because Kareem is of Middle Eastern descent, yeah, he is also religious and yeah. has a, by modern standards, art, uh, antiquated sort of uh, view of mm. family. Yes. Uh, so he's he's a Muslim because mm-hmm. you see him um, praying, praying, right? And he, I think he stands up and says, "My cousin was in that the group up there. Mm-hmm. My cousin dies." 
Yeah, he does. He gets hit by the avalanche straight yeah. away. So he's dead. Yeah. And, and he just, knows as well that his brother is probably dead. His cousin is probably dead. Yeah. But and then he stands anyway. up and says, my cousin was in that party. It's my duty to go. Yeah. But that, what, what duty is that? Is that a religious Is his duty? cousin going to be glad that he's, you know, that he's going after him? That's what I mean. I don't know what duty it is. Mm. Is there a... I, I, I'm not... I, I haven't done the research. I'm not au okay fait with the ins and outs Have of you done the research? Islamic law. No, I don't know a lot about Islamic law. Uh, if, if listeners do know more than I do and want to correct me on anything I've got wrong, do email in howtosurviveshow at gmail.com. But I don't, I don't know of any logical law that would say, or, or duty. Yeah. It, like if my cousin died on a mountain, I love my family. Yeah. But I'd be like, well... Yeah, I'm not, I, there's little I can do. Yeah, it's not um, my duty. <laughs> I wonder if it's. I mean, that's his vocation already, isn't it? Well, he's a climbing a mountain, climbing climb mountain to rescue. People so it'd be more like um, if your cousin died halfway through recording a high quality but only moderately successful podcast. Yeah, then would you come in halfway through and, and finish reading his script or whatever? Yeah, I would do that. Yeah, there you go. Because you've got the acumen to do it. There's, there's would you say it's my duty? I wouldn't do that if, say, the, the, he died in a fire and the podcast right. studio was still on fire. Yeah, he died uh, because he was reciting like an ancient death curse. Yeah, exactly. And you're like, well, it's my duty to <laughs> Exactly, yeah. <laughs> it's a suicide mission, right, yeah. is what you're saying. You don't subscribe to a suicide mission due to a sense of duty unless your character has been written in broad strokes hmm. by... Orientalizing racism. Are you are you saying is the survival tip don't orient orientalize people or is it don't be orientalized by people? Right. Okay. So that that is really something that Kareem should have thought about. Uh, <laughs> Alexander Sadiq, I believe. Yeah. Um, Doran Martel. Yeah, that's right. That's him. Mm, I believe so. Well, he, he did a, about as much to the plot of Vertical Limit as he did to Game of Thrones. Yeah. Um, Joe, K2 Base Camp, it seems like a big operation. They've got people running it. They've got technology, etc. Mm. Why are they reliant on the Pakistani army's leftover explosives to blow up ice? Surely, given that uh, there are two avalanches mm. within the three days that we see on the, in the film, yeah. they would have some sort of protocol for blowing their way into ice that didn't require the coincidence of the <laughs> Pakistani army being on site? Uh, I think it's more that time's of the essence. You're probably right. They could have got a drill, perhaps. No, no, no. I'm saying non-volatile explosives. Right. Like, there must be some sort of Well, the Pakistani for... army must have a grenade. Right. Or, or the people who run a mountain climbing operation should have, a, like, <laughs> protocol in place in case people become trapped in a crevasse. Yeah, yeah. That is surely, you know... A risk that is feasible and possible. Yeah. Or is it that they just go, well, they're trapped under ice. There's nothing that we can do normally. And Peter is the one who sort of um, drags them to the army in order to pick up the uh, nitroglycerin. Uh, that's possibly it. He's he's Because it's only through his connection with the general of the army. Yeah. Uh, that. Yeah. Why does he know the general of the army? Because uh, he's um, airlifted off the mountain with his aid uh, by the Pakistani army. But he seems to know him before. He's like, oh... It's good no, to he's see like, you. oh, it's, um, it's good to have you here. National Geographic's always welcome. Right, yeah. I see. So it's just like yeah. friendly. Mm -hmm. Yeah, well, I, I, yeah, what you're saying is prepare for the worst. Yeah. Mm. It's, it's a dereliction of duty. And to be honest, I'm not surprised that uh, his company's going out of business. Yeah, his company. Yeah, he's, he's right because he's. We're going. Yeah, they want to do an article on going bankrupt at twenty thousand feet or whatever. Sorry, no, I mean the guy who operates the base camp. Yeah, he got. It. Oh, sorry. Yeah. yeah, no, that is right. Yeah, yeah, going bankrupt at twenty thousand feet, of course. Yeah. It's a quick one on mm -hmm. um, when they're in the when they're trapped in the crevasse. You got Peter and the the billionaire guy. Mm -hmm. You know they're in there. The other guy, Tom, is dead. Yeah. And they re realise there's a pack. Mm -hmm. a you mean Annie and Vaughan? What did I say? Peter and Vaughan. So Annie and Vaughan mm -hmm. are trapped in the crevasse. Yeah. Tom is dead, having mm -hmm. been murdered by 
Bayern. 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 Yeah. And they realise there's a backpack trapped in the ice, like, above a big drop. Yeah. At this point, Annie is succumbing to the effects of edema mm-hmm. and is, like, continually bending over to, like, cough up blood, basically. Yeah. Yet, she's the one who so- tries to navigate the ice shelf. Yeah. And then starts coughing and then falls in. Yeah. Uh, I wonder if this is a, um indication of Vaughan's character. It may be, but then surely she'd go, well, I'm not, I'm not going there because I'll die. But it might save them. If, if we were like, oh, look, we're, we're, being, we're dying and yeah. there's medicine over there that could save us both, but I'm not going to go. You might go, well, I don't want to go either, but if he's not going to go, then the only other option is that I go because I need the medicine to not die. That's a good point. But surely Vaughan strikes me as quite a selfish person. Yeah. Um, so he would presumably say, well, it's better that and better that I go rather than send Annie because Annie mm. will not... If you want the job done properly, do it yourself, right? I don't think that's a, a uh, necessarily, in this instance, a uh, motto that he lives by. <laughs> <laughs> if, it, I, if, it, if the thing in question is... Uh, you know, putting, putting yourself yeah. in mortal danger. He doesn't um, do that. Yeah. Himself. He's he's been shown to sacrifice other people for his own survival. Yeah, correct. Well, I've got one uh, one final one, and it's for Vaughan as well. Is it mealy mouthed? We, uh, many, 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 we haven't had many mealy. <laughs> <laughs> Easy for you to say. Yeah, we haven't had many mealy mouthed reply. We haven't had many mealy mouthed suggestions today. Uh, it's again a relatively simple one. Just take the hint, right? He's he's a successful businessman. He's in the oil game. He's clearly used to getting his way, but uh, it doesn't apply to Mother Nature, does it, Joe? No. Um, and he obviously believes otherwise. He seems to think that his influence stretches to the fact that uh, through strength of will alone, yeah. he can decide that the weather is not going to kill them. Um, <laughs> He was sent a pretty clear signal <laughs> yeah. last time uh, that it's a dangerous endeavour to uh, climb K2, mm. and he ignored it. And after that and his survival, he gets a lot of credit from the uh, climbing community. You know, you've got Skip saying, um, oh, he's a hell of a climber. Yeah, um, he, he went up there with a group, came back, and then he survived. Yeah, yeah, so he must, be, he must be really good at climbing. But the joke's on him, because uh, he's dead now, so... yeah. He's not that good a climber. A good climber... Would have climbed up that rope. <laughs> a good climber would have gone, well, I'm going to die if we stay on this uh, yeah. ice field, so we should go back down where it's safe. Yeah, he didn't even get to do his little um, PR, PR stuff. Yeah. Yeah. The It's an amazing thing that good, he's good managed... Good PR to die, though. You get a lot of press for that. Is it? Well, It's not good business acumen to die... die. <laughs> <laughs> just at all is it no. really like if you think of all the, the 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 world's greatest businessmen at the moment you know yeah. what whatever you think about their morals bill gates jeff bezos uh mark zuckerberg yeah. you know none of them are dead joe are they <laughs> no, that's true <laughs> and steve that's because jobs, steve jobs did probably do a lot for apple in dying because he became a bit of an icon right would you agree um i think he was already iconic wasn't he yeah i guess so um if you think of all the all the photos of him uh, you know, the iconic photos. Yeah. They were all taken when he was alive. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, fair point. So, well, that, who's, who's, <laughs> it's not uh, like Jesus. <laughs> who's, CEO, who's CEO of Apple now? Um, it's not, is it Steve Wozniak? Tim Cook, I think. Oh, maybe, yeah. It's the Steve point Wozniak. is we don't, we don't know yeah, for sure. There you go. Well, that's because that's right. they're dining out on jobs, isn't it? Yeah. Steve Jobs. Yes. Yeah. yeah. Not on their work. But in many ways, Joe, capitalism uh, is built off the back of workers, isn't it? So, uh, yep. in many ways, my mate, language. they are dining yep. out on uh, on the on the jobs of those poor uh, Far Eastern workers. I'm glad you find it funny. I anyway, don't find it funny, <laughs> mate. I don't mate. find it funny. Wipe I don't have an iPhone. Wipe that smile I don't have an iPhone. You've got one in your hand. Need I say more? And on that iPhone, and you call yourself a vegan. And on that iPhone, I've received some emails. How to survive show at gmail.com at how to survive pod if you want to get in touch. First email comes from Elliot. Mm-hmm. Hey, Chris. He says, I'm stuck in a cravat. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, it's just Morse code. 
Uh, hey, Chris and Joe. Me and my friends recently watched Circle. Not The Circle, just Circle. Two very, diff- two very different films okay. on Netflix and really wanted to know both your views on it. Mm. So basically, I'd really recommend watching it and if possible, for there to be an episode about it. A lot of people die. Spoilers. And we just think there could be a lot to discuss about surviving. It's just a really good film that I think you'd probably enjoy anyway. And I really love the podcast and I listen to it every day. Oh, that's very kind, Elliot. Thank yeah. you very much. Do you not have anything better to do? <laughs> <laughs> but, uh, uh, thanks, Elliot. That's kind. Now, interestingly, mm. coming up in the next few weeks, we do have Shapes Season, <laughs> where we'll be covering <laughs> Circle and Triangle. Is that true? Yeah. Great. Looking forward to it. Why yeah. not? Circle and Let's triangle. Pack them in. Triangle is about the Bermuda Triangle and something weird happens. Yeah. I, that's all I know. Okay. Great stuff. You're so, right. Elliot. Your... And that's circle, not the circle. Yes. Is the circle some sort of like the circle, witch? No, film? no. The, I'm pretty sure the circle is the one with Emma Watson and Tom Hanks. And it's about a, oh, yeah, a yeah, proto yeah. Google world where capitalism is really bad. That's or right. Or yeah. something like that. Yeah. 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 Haven't seen it. Mm. Uh, second email comes from Ryan. Boys, as a connoisseur of bad movies, I was shocked, appalled, and disappointed when you said you weren't going to do all the Hellraiser sequels. They're all so awful that I can't help but enjoy them just once. I want to take this time to formally nominate the series to follow (laughs) Paranormal Activity as the recurring series on the show. One of the sequels even has Henry Henry Cavill in it. Superman. (laughs) Big fan, and thanks for the hours of enjoyment. Ryan in Orlando. P.S. Even though it's been years since I saw most of the crappy sequels, I was still horrified in myself for getting every question in this week's quiz right. Very good. Yeah. I did get quite... I've never seen them and I got quite a lot. Yeah. So... Not as many as I think you think you did. No. (laughs) Well, Ryan, thank you for your email. Yeah. It's been taken under consideration and will be weighed up in the next uh, seven weeks. weeks. yeah. Yeah. We... um, any other suggestions for series? Harry Potter, maybe. What do you think of that? I think that's a bit that's a bit off brand for us. Isn't yeah, it? not scary enough. Yeah, exactly. Yeah, it, I thought you meant. Did you mean to say too scary? Because you said not scary enough with a face that implied that you were joking. Yeah, too scary. Too scary. Well, don't correct it now. <laughs> I'm not going to let you cut that out and replace it. No, it's very. It's a very scary film. Yeah. <laughs> um, <laughs> Harry Potter's good. Good stuff. Yeah. Good when you're ten. Mm. Isn't it? I don't mind them. I know. You know you've got the tattoo. I've seen it. Yeah. Well, like our friend Kareem says, Joe, all men die, but Allah says it's what we do before we die that counts. So why not rate and review us on iTunes? <laughs> Five star review goes yeah. a long way to helping us find a wider audience. And uh, thank you very much for listening. As we mentioned next week, point break. Uh, Joe's already wearing his bandana. Yeah. Uh, in preparation. Yeah, I always wear a bandana. Yeah. And uh, we'll we'll have our flip-flops on <laughs> <laughs> and the masks as well. Thank you very much for listening. That was episode 144 mm-hmm. of the House of Five podcast. See you next week. And until then, Joe... Cowabunga, dude! Great stuff. <laughs>